Madam is having experience in post-graduation, graduation teaching. Of course, she is handling uh, Indian Council of Medical Research, uh, some uh, projects, also RKU projects, and uh, some deep projects. She <coughs> participated, participated in many seminars, conferences, and she got uh, some of the awards also. Uh, of course, presently she is head of the Malnad Gidda Research Center in uh, Shumaga, placed at Shumaga. Uh, of course, she is involved in extension teaching and also research. And that is the beauty of our uh, resource person. And again, she is very practical. She is down to the earth and she will start with uh, very minute things and end with the beautiful things. That is one thing. And uh, now she is going to talk about uh, the livestock and your natural farming. Of course, you know breeds. Breeds are um, our especially indigenous breeds. And what is the importance of indigenous breeds and what is the uh, importance of uh, nowadays we are all talking about good milk, bad milk, but there is no good and bad milk. That milk depends on the only what we feed to the animals. Of course, then some protein structure or something else will be different. And she so will talk about conservation of breeds and what are the breeds we have. And also, so livestock is important. As our vice chancellor was telling that we have to without livestock you can not go for natural farming. So if you see yesterday, day before yesterday, Bijamrucha, Ganamruta, there is a ghee, there is a milk, there is uh, something, uh, desi menu, desi dung, and everything, desi hasu, desi cattle, urine. So that will be the become a big uh, source for your natural farming. Of course, she is going to elaborate all these things along with that because Malnad Gita is a prize breed of our Western God, especially Chikmangalur, Shumaga, Udupi. And this is called as a Western Ghat, what you have seen in uh, Kemen Gundi. So from that side uh, up to Udupi. And Shumaga is a hub of uh, Malnada. It is called as Malnada. So Malnada Gita is uh, one of the best drought breed. She will talk about value addition of what is the value, what is the value of milk and what are the products we can do with, with uh, Malnada Gita. So with this introduction, I welcome for this session Dr. Jayasri, Madam, on behalf of all the participants and AVK and all the organizers. Uh, we are welcome you, madam. So, the session is yours. You can talk, you can uh, discuss and everything. Thank you. Okay, some participants are there in online also. Not be online, other from different colleges and students. 
ओके 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 गुड नो दे विल बी डू लाइवली लाइव इट विल बी गोइंग Okay, good morning to everyone. So I think you are all becoming natural now. So many natural faces I am seeing with the natural farming uh, practices. Huh? Uh, so here in my talk, I am not going to bore you with the different breeds or explanation of the breeds, something like that. But in a nutshell, how you can, uh, just by seeing an animal, how you can classify or uh, to which category it belongs. That's, uh, that should be the thing of uh, any farmer or any layman or in, even an agriculture scientist. Okay, that will be my, so in that context, I'll say how the breeds uh, have been adapted to the different climatic conditions or the agroecological zones. So in a brief, I will age groups and um, according to the bulls, bullocks which are used for drafting, bulls which are used for uh, breeding. Uh, then uh, the cattle which fits only for the supply of flesh, that is also mentioned. So though we are now uh, against slaughtering of the cattle, but it's still, still it has been used as a uh, food animal also some time ago. And the buffaloes also are used as a draft. Then uh, the heifers, heifer selection or the selection of the animal uh, female before it becomes pregnant for the first time, uh, that is also a very important aspect mentioned in Arthashastra. Uh, then another one is the barren animals, which doesn't have any other purpose, which, which, which is uh, exhausted of its all age or it has crossed the age of lactation and all those things, uh, then still they are maintained for the manurial value. Manurial, they, till it dies of its natural um, uh, thing. So the calves that are one or two months old as, um, as well as those which are still younger. So they have given preference to all age groups. So what we have done in the recent past is as soon as the calf is born, uh, that's a early species, very poor thing for the cattle, the male is born, uh, they say male calf is born with a low tone. If a female calf, a female calf is born, like this time we got a female calf. So that is how the only species where uh, they express. But now how we are going to turn, we cannot avoid this 50-50% uh, or the ratio, natural uh, sex ratio in animals. But now with the recent uh, intervention of this uh, sex sorted semen, you know, we are getting the uh, semen itself sorted out for the female calves. More female calves, so 90% uh, will become female calves and the sex sorting is done using a flow cytometer. I think you have a talk on flow cytometer. That's the instrument which is used to sort the semen uh, because the XX, XY, you know, X, X chromosome uh, is the female. XY is the male. The Y chromosome is very small. The molecular weight of the uh, sperms carrying the, uh, so either it should be X bearing or Y bearing spermatozoa. So in a haploid uh, uh, sperms, no, the 50% uh, of the semen that is collected will have uh, X-bearing spermatozoa, 50% will be having Y-bearing. If it is not exactly 50%, it should be like that in nature. So the flow cytometer sorts out the X-bearing spermatozoa, which is having higher molecular weight. Because just imagine the X and the Y, which, has, which is not having one portion. So definitely the molecular weight is less. The Y, y chromosome is a smaller one. So the molecular weight is less based on that methodology. The X-bearing are all separated and that becomes the uh, female. In Western countries, they use the Y-bearing spermatozoa for uh, the beef production because they want a larger size animal which gives uh, uh, the muzzles. So they sort the semen for getting uh, beef producing animals, Y sorted semen. And so we are using this X sorted semen. Now it has come for almost uh, many breeds. It's available uh, now officially also. We have started using in the breeding program. So that is where uh, the advancement, but whatever it is uh, in the Shastras also, it is mentioned that you have to have a category of these animals according to their age groups, according to their uh, physical structures. So if you say globally, there are more than 7,000 uh, domestic livestock breeds, including all the species. When I say livestock, it includes all the domestic animals, cattle, sheep, buffalo, uh, and goats. Hmm? 
uh, then the regional breeds, so different uh, continental breeds. Different continents have their breeds, and uh, there are some 500 transboundary breeds, means uh, which are sharing between uh, two countries, two regions. Then uh, international transboundary, like uh, China and Asia. Then uh, like that neighboring uh, European and China, like that and the border regions, because the animal cannot distinguish whether it is Andhra or Karnataka. So there will be a breed which is shared between uh, Tamil Nadu and Karnataka, Karnataka and Andhra, Kerala, Karnataka, like that. And if you say Maharashtra, like that, adjust and all the border districts uh, will have breeds which are admixture of both the breeds because they don't have, they don't, they discriminate only based on the geographical location or availability of the fodder or the preferences of the farmers. So naturally, they don't have a border. That's why there is a trans boundary. So this uh, trans, um, about, uh, for the past 50 years, 1,500 mammalian species have been lost and cannot be replaced. So what has happened, this uh, lost, major, major reason uh, can be with the intervention of the human and also some due to natural. But uh, the natural is very few. Um, with, because the preference, no, you go on preferring. So if you think of uh, the elephants might have been definitely used in those days for drafting to build a big temple or gopura, definitely there were no other instruments except the elephant which can carry such uh, big uh, stones no, to, from, for building a temple. So now we are not finding so many number of elephants because we are, we are using other methods. So definitely man <laughs> intervention is there. Uh, like not preferring a particular species. So this trans uh, border migration of important breeds due to economic reasons um, and biotic factors like climate change, parasitism, and lineage. So what happens in mass attack of a um, particular disease or full herd has, has been disappeared or they get diluted with other breeds. Other, whatever is available, it will try to bait within that species. So these are all uh, some of the reasons. And uh, you know that I think in your um, agronomy courses, you would have studied about how the people uh, started the agriculture or they started living in one place. Before that, they were nomadic. So along with them, the animals also will move. Whatever animals they want, they have moved. So even now, we can say that for the past 50, 60 years, uh, we are using European breed salmon, is it not? HF for the Jersey salmon. Uh, everywhere, interior of the village, you can see the Jersey or the HF. It is again a by migration of a breed, transboundary breed, due to the policy decisions. Due to the because the government has uh, introduced that, like any other uh, crop or new variety, you can see the uh, what is that? I frequently come across that happy fruit or the red color fruit, which is. Uh, uh, dragon fruit. So that has come from the desert area. Now you can see in every part. So that is also a migration of a one, uh, one new variety which has been introduced. And now it will start existing here. Likewise, the animals have also migrated and they have got settled. Settled in one place. Now, which is original, which is duplicate. When, when we conduct a, a farmer's training, when we ask uh, our younger generation may not be knowing HF and Jersey is from another country at all because they are their parents have also seen as soon as they are born they have seen hf and jersey because it is there for the past 70 years so they when i ask uh, which is uh, mention uh, a native breed they will write a hf in our questionnaire because uh, obviously what they are writing is correct because they have not seen the other breeds hmm? so this uh, livestock diversity why we need to have this diverse diverse uh, nature definitely it nourishes the soil it nourishes the soil as I said it eats the grass and it excretes the dung which converts uh, it is converted converted into a uh, manure or which enriches the soil I am not going to deep into this aspect how how you are going to for what purpose why we are telling uh, we need to conserve the local breeds or the desi breeds whatever the title they have given uh, for me, food animal, one is for food, milk, meat, and egg. Uh, so you can see again, we are converting them 
uh, into some of the products uh, which is um, uh, which is edible or which is liked by many people some examples i have given the darwad buffalo pe darwad peda <laughs> i think you would have you would have tasted that the speciality of the darwad region the peda from the buffalo milk uh, then the horses and uh, the mules or the donkeys which are used for transport uh, then the companion animals definitely the companion animals have also evolved through uh, evolved through because of the preference of a particular breed for by a uh, human as whichever guards the uh, farm whichever guards the houses or it just gives psychological comfort then the non food non food products like the wool animal fibers skins bones horns Uh, like that uh, so these are the things and uh, even the smaller species smaller species are kept in the uh, kitchen garden even the poultry or the duck or something every house in kerala you can see they have some ducks uh, uh, because they have ponds so uh, even in uh, some larger uh, uh, establishment they will have the uh, other species of uh, poultry also uh, they also contribute definitely they eat on the pests insect pests or the uh, harmful uh, ones which are going to harm the roots they peck and eat on that material that is how they create a, a diverse or a balance between the uh, animal and the uh, soil okay so now let us uh, come to my main topic uh, when we talk of a breed what is uh, called as a breed and i will be elaborating uh, on this aspect in a wholesome way uh, this sub, uh, a breed is a subspecific group of a livestock so if i say cattle cattle has some 500 600 breeds uh, globally which are having definable and identifiable external characters so you should be able to uh, say the just by seeing the horn of that animal and the horn of another animal you should be able they are different breeds Which, uh, which you don't need any instrument at all. You just visualize, and then you are able to tell. And uh, they will be able to visually appraise them. And the same species which are existing in a geographical or a cultural separation. Uh, so in my talk, I have these first uh, few will be on the geographically how they are separated. The next I will tell about how the culturally or the community has participated in evolution of the uh, different breeds. Uh, those two aspects we I will cover. So they should be phenotypically similar. So they should have external features in similar. They should have an origin of geographical origin from a separate place, and sufficient number should be there. Then we call them as a breed and. we have an agency the national bureau of animal genetic resources uh, in uh, karnal uh, which is the sole authority to register the breeds so every year they uh, the uh, breed number is going on increasing as it gets registered okay now when they started they had now some 30 breeds now there are 53 breeds registered but uh, on the ancient literature says there are more than hundreds of breeds which were existing in india now they are trying to trace back and how they are distinctly different from the other breeds so that is the definition of the breed so this uh, native breeds definitely have a varied coat color and uh, they they have the capacity to adjust to the um, uh, body adjust their body temperature to according to the seasons because uh, we know the extremes up to 45 degrees it goes and then sometimes it comes even lesser than 12 in a particular place so if i say uh, the breeds from rajasthan they have to cope up with both these extremes so that is the speciality of these uh, indian breeds but this uh, may not affect the milk quality the milk quality uh, there are some uh, studies which says uh, the coat color has got Uh, some relevance or the co fiber length or the hair uh, diameter and the milk quantity and the quality there is uh, there is very mild uh, differences not on the chemical composition but only on the uh, the fat and uh, uh, certain proteins which varies otherwise um, nourishment wise it is going to give the uh, same type of nourishment so if you just uh, see just the point from this one 
this pointer is not working here Lella? so let us see the population trend so i have put the just compared uh, the previous two census that is the 19th and the 20th livestock census uh, what is the status of um, uh, these um, uh, different species this pointer is not working shilpa pointer work aagtillalla kedara ee tara number pointer ille Okay. So first uh, one uh, shows the livestock. We'll just skip that Karnataka. You just see this only. Uh, 192.49 has come down to 190.9. The red one is 20th livestock. Uh, so that was number has gone uh, ulta. So you can see a slight increase in the population from the 19th and the 20th uh, census so this red one is 20th livestock census for those who are sitting at the back uh, you can see the cattle population has increased some 2 million and again this 1.8 million again the sheep population has increased sufficiently uh, that means the preference of this is in the increasing trend preference of sheep is in the increasing trend likewise the goat also uh, sizable number that is about um, uh, 14 and 10 percent you can see the sheep and goat are uh, on the increasing trend whereas the pig is in the decreasing trend so uh, this is the same with other uh, our Karnataka also you can try to do this this uh, data is available uh, the population in your state you can just check how uh, the population has changed uh, over the uh, years okay. then uh, just if we see the trend uh, if you go back and see the only, I've taken only the cattle as an example here. Uh, that is 17, 18, 19, and 20th. So this, um, see the red one is the indigenous, pure native breeds. What we are talking of the natural farming system, we have to have the native breeds. Uh, it is in the decreasing trend, okay? Uh, and whereas the total cattle is increasing or the uh, this blue one is the exotic crossbred that is again increasing so that means to say this portion is uh, or this portion is affected by this that is because the indigenous the total population has not changed much okay that this 190 uh, 185 increased and then 199 see in the 2007 it has grown but then it is almost same Whereas uh, the indigenous one, the red one, has decreased and this has increased. That means the crossbreeds are trying to invade over the presence of the indigenous breeds. Crossbreed population is going on increasing and the pure breed native is going on decreasing. So now the challenge uh, is we need, we need more of this. If we are going to say that I should have uh, the dung or um, urine from a native cow for natural farming system definitely this population should increase or the preference of people keeping this should increase so what and all we have to do because it doesn't actually have any um, cost or expenditure the farmer needn't spend much on maintaining an indigenous breed whereas here he needs to spend spend more on maintaining a crossbred so that is the only pinch point so I used to say to some farmers, you have crossbred because you need to have money. They need money to sell milk and we also need money living in the cities. We need milk, no? Or else milk will reduce very much, milk production. So uh, you have, uh, along with that, you have some two, three native cows also. That's how, because it is not going to cost on you. It's not an expenditure. Only space you have to provide for them. Whatever waste you are going to feed is going to feed. It's not going to ask any additional concentrates additional investment on feeding see the major any livestock husbandry the major investment or 70 percent of the investment goes on goes to feeding even in our house if you say a monthly budget majority goes to our food only 
you all agree, I think, all of you are family people. Our budget goes majority, not for the other things, 70%. Animals also like the 70% investment goes for food, feeding only. So there if the li indigenous livestock are going to uh, ask for lesser feed only because it is easily maintained and they are uh, having the natural disease resistant power, definitely it is we can convince the farmer to have along with three, four crossbred, two or three native animals for preparing the jivamrita, bijamrita, all those things. Only thing, they need a space, you need a separate arrangement to collect their dung and urine. Otherwise, they don't ask for anything much. So that is how we should see in the uh, 21st life. I think ne next year they will be doing the census. We should see some change uh, in the uh, trend of the indigenous breed because this was in 2019. So another five years once the census are conducted. So these are the I said, 53 breeds. 53 breeds, now they are telling that should be hundreds of breeds, hundreds or more breeds in our country as per the ancient literatures. So just I have put this uh, clumsily uh, to show that the wealth of our nation. So we should be really proud of this. So let us see how these 53 are classified um, and how we can identify. All 53 to remember is definitely an, uh, a, a big task. Okay. Uh, so this, uh, how you are going to identify, you see, uh, like that, that is one species I showed the big picture. Uh, but like that, you say for buffaloes, there are more than 16 breeds, I think 16, 17 breeds. Uh, then for sheep and goats, there are more than 60 breeds. 60 breeds registered in uh, sheep and goat and then uh, pig also. Now we are adding uh, she, uh, ducks as well as uh, the geese and uh, the uh, dogs are also added to the list. The NBHR has taken the responsibility of registering even the uh, dog breeds. Uh, huh? Yes, four no? is on the phone. Okay. So you have most productive animals like the Mura buffaloes, okay, and uh, well adapted breeds. See these breeds: no, Gir, Tar, Parker, Sahiwal, or Red Sindhi. No, as the name indicates, Gir is from Gujarat. This Tar Parker, Tar Desert, which can cross the desert. Tar Parker, no? Tar Parker, they can cross the desert, walk in the desert. Imagine we walking in the hot sun, but these cows, they walk in the desert, they feed on the uh, whatever dry, whatever material is there, uh, the cactus or that, and then it gives good quality milk. So that is the power. Then the Sahi wall. Sahi wall. Uh, then Red Sindhi again it is uh, seen in Pakistan as well as in the Sindh province uh, both. So these are milch breeds which are well adapted. Then you have the most prolific breeds. See the, uh, the goats have the multiple kids. You know, they can give three, four, five. So you have the black Bengal goat Barbary and beetle which can give more than two or three kids at a time at a time, that is, um, uh, which is not seen in other goat breeds of Western countries. It is very unique to our Indian countries. Then good carpet wool breeds. The carpet wool, uh, though we don't have, we don't uh, need also the fine wool unless we want to uh, uh, give it to other countries, get some export and get some uh, money out of it. We don't need uh, the fine wool for our type of climate, whereas we need a carpet carpet wool to put uh, on the floor during the uh, winter season. So we have this uh, Magra uh, carpet wool breed and then the uh, highly prolific uh, breed, uh, this Garol. I think um, uh, you all have heard of this uh, Nari Sparna. Huh? Have you heard of this Nari Sparna breed? A, a breed which is a synthetic breed evolved from this Garol which is having, a, uh, which was crossed. Uh, this Garol is crossed with a Deccani breed. Deccani breed of Maharashtra and uh, they have evolved a breed called uh, Nari Swarna, the Nari group, uh, the um, animal research institute. It's a private uh, institution who does research on this where they have done uh, and evolved a new breed called as uh, Nari, that is the initial N-A-R-I, which is uh, having the ability to give twins 25%. 25% of the population, you can get uh, twins. Uh, so, one, but in India, we have only the Garol. You know, if you just uh, trace this Garol, this Garol sheep has been uh, taken to Australia long, long ago uh, for this unique character of uh, twinning. 
So they have crossed uh, with those uh, breeds which were existing in Australia and they were able to get that winning. So that is how the same p persons, Paltan uh, Nariswa people, they were working in that Australian farms and they have come back to India. They have set up their lab and they evolved a new breed, Nariswarna. And uh, I think it was supplied in our Karnataka, I don't know about Andhra and other state. Uh, in Karnataka, they have uh, uh, supplied that to farmers also uh, to get a twin because sheep normally gives only one uh, lamb at a time. So this, uh, so we have some, some, some uh, many other, the list goes on what are the specialities of our native breeds. So these type of uh, extremes are there in our breed which are of uh, beneficial importance. So how we are going to bring back or whether these uh, exotic breeds are going to suppress the native breeds. So let us see how the breeds are classified. See, normal classification we do with, uh, with a utility, uh, like based on uh, draft purpose, draft breed, dairy breed, and dual purpose breed. That is the normal uh, classification. Now I am going to give you a different perspective of the classification uh, based on the phenotypic characters so that we can easily remember them and also guess for what purpose it can be used, whether it can be dual or for the milch purpose, and uh, the geographical origin and based on the uh, age groups. So these are the normal uh, methods of classification. So let us see the first group. The first group is called as uh, the lyre horn. Lyre is a bird, a uh, bird in Australia, which has a tail which is having uh, a curve like this. The lyre bird's tail uh, has a curve like this, you can see here. So that is lyre horn and they are grey cattle with a wide forehead. Uh, so now you have to, like a beauty pageant, what and all we see to describe a person as beauty. Now let us describe our cows how they are beautiful by seeing their forehead and uh, the orbital arches. It's not working. Okay, this orbital arches in this way, that is over the eye, uh, you can see a fold of skin uh, in gear on uh, many of the native bleeds, this star parker and all. It is just giving a protection. It is doing something. Okay. So this one, this portion, you can see in all these breeds, it is giving a protection to the eyes during the hot seasons, during the, when they cross, when they walk in the deserts. And uh, they are um, thin or flat dished face. So this portion, you, uh, you say, uh, if it is having a dish, like uh, a curve like thing, it is a dished face, huh? uh, or a flat one like this. So this Kenkata, Kerigar, Kankraj, Tar Parker, uh, Malvi, all are from the desert regions, desert uh, regions of uh, Rajasthan, uh, which are having uh, the particular character. So that is, you just see the horn, you just see the fo forehead, you just see the presence of the, um, uh, these uh, orbital arches. Then you can guess this is from that particular region, uh, which belongs to group one. Then in group two, uh, just um, you have short horn, white or gray, and uh, the shape. You can see this uh, face is uh, here. You can see the coffin shape, the shape of a coffin, uh, like a trapezium. One side it will be lengthy, so that is called as coffin shape, and a convex face. You can appreciate in this breed, which is having a bulge. Uh, Ungol, Haryana, Mewati, and Gaulav. Uh, these all come in the group two category, group two category, okay. Um, coffin shaped skull. Okay. Uh, and it, it is a very big group, very big group where majority, uh, the Krishna Valley, Nagori, Rati, Bachor. That is you come down uh, south or the middle part of India, uh, you have most of these uh, breeds. Uh, and uh, this breed, Krishna Valley, uh, it's almost, uh, it he come to the verge of extinction. Uh, less than 1,000 it is there. Now uh, some efforts have been put to increase its number. Because it, uh, it resembles the uh, killer breed, 
So people have, um, like the uh, doctors or whoever uh, preference for going for Kilar and they have inseminated Krishna Valley with the Kilar 7, so they got diluted. So now that is, uh, these are so shorter than the Kilar, Kilar breeds, which is used for, but this is also a good uh, drafting breed, uh, but also has a, a milk, uh, milk uh, so, uh, little quantity of milk. So that is how uh, it is, um, it has been trying to re re rescue this particular breed. Then this again, uh, this is about from the north we came to the middle part of India, now the western part, uh, you have the Gir and the Red Siddhi uh, towards the Punjab and uh, towards Gujarat. So these are having heavy dewlap, you can see this portion is the dewlap, heavy dewlap and the sheath. Uh, near the, the uh, urinary tract, you see the sheath. And this, uh, see the loose skin or the bigger um, skin area, it increases the skin area, so also the sweat glands. A lot of sweat glands or the number of sweat glands over the body surface is increased so that it can overcome the heat. And also, they may be red in color or white, unlike the previous group which was more uh, of gray in color, they are having red and red spots also, dotted ones also you can see. And the horns are a little curled, and this it is not there. Uh, they are called and uh, they are on the lateral. Unlike in the previous one where the horns were on the top of the forehead, now here they are seen on the sides, on the sides. So that is uh, one difference and that is why we find the forehead to be more bulged uh, in these breeds. That is uh, group three. Uh, continued with that, uh, the, these are all uh, milch purpose breeds, uh, Sahiwal, Dangi, Deoni and Dimari. So you can see the red spots as well as uh, the horns erupting on the sides. This must be a aged cow, so it is grown lengthy. And uh, the sheath also, in all these you can see the dewlap as well as the sheath uh, where hanging. So which increases the bo uh, body surface area. Then the group four, group four is the one uh, which is uh, Amrit Mahal, Hallikar, Kangayam, Kilar, and uh, this Bargur. And this Bargur alone will have this brown and white spots. And in all these, they have the shades of gray, shades of brown, or white, uh, shades of white like this. So they also have um, the, the their compact animal with powerful quarters. That is, they can walk, walk, walk for 18 hours. Also, they can do work. And uh, they have a tight sheath, unlike the other one, and a prominent forehead, and the horns em emerge from the pole. That is almost, uh, uh, you can see here, the, this portion is called as the pole on the skull. So from that, the horns erupt. Very closely, the horns erupt. So these are the, the different characters of the group four. Okay? And most of them are very good draft animals, and uh, these... Um, the next one is the group five. So I think now you are able to recollect group one, two, three, the major difference. Huh? Uh, the group five, which is a mixed type, it will have all colors. They are also used for minimum drafting. They are also used for milk, both dual purpose. And they have a hump and a slightly lyre shaped horn, or uh, stump like horn. Unlike the previous one, which has a long horns, they have a stump like horns. And uh, some will have hairs, more hairs also in the hilly tract. We can see that in this uh, Lakimi, uh, Badri, and Malnad uh, the hairy breeds also, hairy variants in that also. Uh, and also all mixture, admixture of different colors, and they are short stature. That is group five. And the group six is the Dani breed, uh, which are very huge breeds uh, which is seen in the India-Pakistan border. Uh, they, uh, they are more in the uh, Pakistan side, but they are also seen, uh, they are called as the transboundary breeds, uh, which is having very in varied colors. Here again, it is having varied color, but a very large, huge breed. So that is the, the Dunny breed. This also we see in India, okay? So there are six uh, breeds. So why, why these uh, breeds uh, are, so this is about the breed, but we don't find 
uh, the sufficient number of these breeds, whatever uh, five groups, uh, leave the six, uh, the five groups, uh, sufficient number in pure form. So in pure form, they are not found. One reason, because in 1960 to 70, they started the artificial insemination. That was the time when uh, the intensive cattle development program or different uh, policies have come dictated by the government of India to increase the milk production. So before that, up to 1960-65 or before the, um, the white revolution, uh, we were uh, importing milk powder. So now the, uh, our uh, policy makers thought we should make uh, a self-sufficient country for the milk. Now we are topping in the milk production. Uh, that's how the crossbreeding program came. But at that point of time, there was no thought process to safeguard that breed. They had the only uh, motto to increase milk production. So many of them which were not uh, having pure breed character or which may be pure breed were inseminated with a exotic semens or a crossbred semen so that the, the milk production can be increased. So that is how gradually we could see that the milk production increased drastically, but that point of time we lost many of the pure breeds. Now the thought has come in the recent uh, breeding policy, what they have told. Now the breeding tract is demarcated, which are the native uh, breeds, I will show in my future slides, uh, how to identify where the breeding tract of a particular breed is this. I think you are all from different uh, parts of the country. Then you can uh, guess at least what is there in my place of work. At least that we should say the farmers encourage the farmers to safeguard that breed. If everyone as an agriculture or animal husbandry scientist, if you are going to have that responsibility, definitely we can resurrect all the breeds. Because now the breed semen is available. All those 53 breed semen is available. Once we know this region is native of a particular breed, you make the farmers to motivate the farmers to have that pure breed only. Another 20, 30 years, we may have all in, in the breeding tag, the pure form of that particular breed, which we have lost. We can definitely resurrect. So that is there with the hands of the grassroots level. Like you may be in a uh, university, but you will be training your agriculture uh, uh, officers uh, from your region. So through them, we can reach. Likewise, the veterinarians, we have doctors, we train them who are working in the field be, because they are the one who are going to uh, do the insemination there. So in your district, you have. So that is in the breeding policy, what they have done, wherever the breeding tract of a particular pure breed is there, the, uh, the persons have to use that. They have given a target. If it is uh, like killer breeding tract, they will supply more killer and you have to document them and give how many killer semen you have inseminated. So like that in one year, they will have more killer calves. Then in the next year, again, the daughters born uh, in two, three years, again, if they are going to give a killer semen, definitely in the third generation, we will have another 20, 25 years, we will have all the pure breeds resurrected. Uh, that is only in the hands of us. Okay. So what are, what are the reasons I am not, shall I explain this? Uh, so why, why this, uh, the breeds have reduced is because of the uh, loss of natural resources, where the grazing method practice has changed to intensive uh, method of rearing, and the agricultural um, activity has expanded. So they, they and uh, monocropping, where uh, if it is a pa paddy, in those days they, should, they might have paddy or leguminous crop and all those. No, in my grandmother's place they used to put um, these, um, uh, what is black gram. After paddy they put uh, black gram. After harvesting they will put bende. Then again only, uh, the next season only the paddy will come. So, but now it is not uh, done so. Maybe again, it is again the policy dictated whatever that we are doing. Uh, that's the thing. Then the mechanization, the dependency of the animals for transport has sizably reduced. So that is one reason where we have lost many of the preferences have gone or the animal shade available has been occupied by the crossbred animals. So there is no space for them to keep. So they reduce the number. There is no need for a draft animal. There is no uh, bullock cart at all in their house. Then why they need? They may use a tractor or some other mode of transportation, lorry or a truck. 
So that is the reason where it is. Then again the policy. Whatever policy is dictated as a government servant, we do according to whatever. It, because the targets are fixed for the agriculture officer or a veterinary officer. This much you have to do, this much semen you have to do, they would do that. Now that time, even when I started my practice in 1984, we used to catch hold of all the native breeds and castrate. In health camps, only castration camp was there. Castration camp itself was a major thing. And if one crossbred calf is born, that will be appreciated and those doctors will be rewarded, the farmer will be rewarded because he maintains a crossbred calf. Now we have to start rewarding them for having a pure breed of native cow. That is the uh, reverse. So every everything, no, the like the okay. Every seen this. That is global life. Uh, according to the livestock production system. Um, so that is livestock only. Only livestock is kept, or only mixed is kept. Crop only crop is kept, or only grassland is there. Only landless are there rain fed or there only irrigated or there. So like that different, you can see this um, uh, whole country, uh, it is an admixture. You can't say one state is having one particular livestock production system. That's what I wanted to show. Uh, there is no uh, distinction. Every state, every state in our country, you can see yellow, violet, purple, green, all the dots on the state. Uh, whole of the country. That means to say all types of production system are exist in immaterial of a particular state and uh, only uh, in this um, medium to uh, this MGH, you know, mixed crop is seen in the Gangetic plain. Rest all are almost similar. Then this is one of the picture to say uh, how the land uh, use is covered. So when we talk of livestock, we need permanent pastures or the grazing land, which is only 3.2%. And the agricultural land covers 55.3%. So now we have to calculate how much uh, agricultural byproducts are obtained by that 55.3% of land as a fodder, in the form of fodder, and how much pasture we are able to get fodder for the animals all 365 days. So if we think of increasing the number of livestock, we should definitely cushion them with the fodder availability. So what, what methods we can do uh, to conserve the agricultural waste when it is converted into a uh, feed for the animals? How we are going to do? That should be the thought process here. And again, definitely the ecological zones. So ecological zones, how uh, this I will show in another picture, the elevation. So the, uh, how, uh, how much height it is there, uh, how much elevated. So when you go uphill, you can have only smaller species. Uh, larger species live in the lands, plains. So then how you are going to encourage uh, people working in the upland to uh, go for sheep or goat or uh, uh, breeds like Malnad Gita or a short stretched breeds, which can climb up the hill. Uh, then, so if this year the total failure in monsoon in Karnataka, so we are going to definitely face a, a, a fodder deficiency. Because maize is cultivated because there were no rains. Post monsoon rains were not at all there. Hmm? Uh, the agroclimatic divisions, uh, so like uh, how you have the arid, semi arid, humid, subhumid, highland. Now I will explain what are all the breeds found in these. Uh, different agricultural zones so that we can, whoever is working in that particular area can concentrate on uh, the purity of those particular uh, breeds. Then conditions favorable, why I have put this condition favorable for crops is very important for an animal husbandry person because once the harvest happens we get paddy straw, we get ragi straw, maize, everything is totally interdependent. Again, the store of the compost and everything, it is going to turn to the soil uh, once the next crop they are going to start are preparing the land. So definitely the conditions uh, favorable for the crops is very important. And the physiogeographic position, mountainous, uh, whether it is in a river bank like the Indo-Gangetic Plain, Peninsular. So in Karnataka, if you say major part is uh, Deccan Plateau and uh, coastal, coastal plains and uh, one-third growing season. So there would be some uh, locality where 
they will they will be totally depending like uh, a region uh, around bangalore and all you can see like that one season they grow one season kolar and all towards the border of uh, andhra pradesh they use uh, they depend on only one season crop and the next season they depend on animal husbandry sheep or the cross bred uh, animals then non agricultural land so there are, there are definitely non agricultural land how best we can convert these uh, non agricultural land to some other purpose so i will explain about that mm. Mm. so based on so the different uh, people have uh, done a classification uh, based on soil characteristics uh, climate vegetation topography 16 groups are there and bioclimatic features rainfall temperature altitude and vegetation there are five groups then length of uh, growing period cultivation of annual crops whether it is a 90 day crop 60 day crop like that they have classified five groups so as per the planning commission there are 15 uh, uh, groups agroclimatic i think we follow this i think you all follow this fifth planning commission whatever has told then under narp 127 agroclimatic groups are there so uh, so based on that whatever crops whatever seed whatever fertilizer it will be supplied to that particular region so then accordingly we get the feed and fodder for the animals so again at that season if it is a short crop 60 days 90 days crop whether the by products after harvesting the legumes how best we are going because the legume uh, leaves and the see whatever leaf which is broader and which gives a beans like uh, uh, anything uh, like cluster beans or any thing a legume uh, their pods their seed coat their uh, leaves stems everything is a fodder which is rich in protein which may have from at the level of 18% so if you feed to a native animal you need not give concentrate at all Uh, but uh, how we are going to uh, harvest them because now we are feeing, f finding the mechanization uh, one way it is helping the farmer because his dependency on the labor is reduced but now they are using harvester or some methods uh, which helps uh, which doesn't allow them to collect the uh, materials for feeding the animals so what best we can do every crop which is harvested mechanized in using mechanized uh, processes what are all the waste they are generating how best we can use them as an animal feed and uh, we get some of the farmers um, sending us samples uh, from uh, different materials they get from their agriculture and testing it for different uh, uh, nutrient levels in our nutrition labs so these uh, uh, these things has to be thought of uh, you may think after harvesting the legumes uh, you don't need them but definitely they are needed as a fodder how we are going to Uh, store them or preserve them or keep them or encourage the farmers to maintain them as a fodder to their animals then the agro ecological uh, zones national bureau of soil survey says there are uh, 20 20 different uh, agro ecological uh, regions so now when we say when i just superimposed i took the different uh, regions uh, coming under uh the see if i say highland highland which is the region marked on the map in that in that region what are the breeds available what are the species available like that i classified and i was able to get uh, see the humid subtropical and uh, tropical wet and dry these are the two regions where you have more concentration of livestock husbandry or the cattle sheep or the goat um, the tall ones the blue one Uh, in this this blue is the uh, cattle and the red one is buffalo uh, so in these two you can see humid subtropical and the graphs are taller the rest regions are all uh, smaller uh, where the population is less and the density is less whereas it is more in these two regions so we have to concentrate on the breeds in these two regions so that more number of breeds are there in those regions then most indigenous uh, breeds if you say most indigenous breeds again they are distributed in the uh, this humid subtropical tropical wet and uh, semi arid regions so these uh, regions are uh, well adapted by these particular 
uh, breeds. That is number of breeds available in a particular region. Uh, the names of the breeds uh, belonging to a particular region were counted and uh, it has been imposed on this graph. Hmm. So major are distributed in tropical wet, dry region and semi-arid region which is in high and very high vulnerable zone. So if we see these two zones, they have done another one for a climate uh, change studies, which are all the regions which are vulnerable for the climate change. We found which are the regions uh, where the more cattle and livestock are there, those are the regions falling under the vulnerable region. So definitely there is going to be some clash between the change of the climate and the, uh, the pre existence of the present uh, animal population and how we are going to safeguard those animals. That is the question in front of us. So the challenges what we face is the zones, whatever I have shown, so many people have classified different zones and how we are going to concise those zones and concentrate on a particular crop variety for suitable for a particular zone and calculate the number of cattle and the feed and fodder requirement for them. So how much in each products as feed and uh, you see the small fragmented land is also one of the uh, reason where we, you cannot impose the farmer having a small fragmented land to reserve some space for the fodder production. So how best we are going to convert the common uh, grazing lands as a dependent on the monsoonal rains and again the regions which are prone to natural ca calamities, either flood, drought or the uh, which earthquake is totally unpredictable. But the flood, uh, at least we can forecast uh, and safeguard the animals and uh, drought also we can definitely forecast and uh, we can conserve the feed or the water or use other methods to conserve whenever the rain is there or whenever the rains are available and store the water or using um, uh, micro irrigation techniques to conserve the water. So these are the things where but earthquake we cannot, uh, it is totally unpredictable. Okay. So in 2016, uh, they have uh, published one study, if anybody interested you can uh, read that, it will help you to uh, do some projects on those pro on that, uh, that is India's 572 rural uh, districts they have covered in that and they have surveyed and they have classified the vulnerable uh, regions and uh, in that the, what are the criteria they have used, three major criteria uh, for ca classifying them as vulnerable uh, lands, sensitivity, uh, the exposure and then adaptive capacity. In that sensitivity, degraded land, annual rainfall, vulnerability to cyclone or drought. So they will just take the each and every village and they, this district, they have classified them according to that exposure, maximum and minimum temperature, heat wave and cold wave. In that particular 20 years of period, how many times heat wave and cold wave have affected in that region? And the actual survey is done in that adaptive capacity how many agriculturists or their literacy, their gender gap, electrification, and all those things. This uh, survey based on this, they have classified the vulnerable uh, zones. So they, and uh, they, this is being again mapped, whatever the results they obtain has been uh, mapped. Shall I continue, you have something to discuss? So now to, uh, for whatever we say, I think these are all uh, maybe a repetition uh, from some other things. Um, uh, a natural resource management on the crop, improving crop production, improving livestock and fisheries production and intervention by way of res uh, research. E these four points are very much essential if we want to have a resilient, resilient agriculture where it can cope up with any type of climate adversities. So why we have to discuss this? Because we need the agro byproducts as an animal feed and fodder, totally dependent on that. And um, uh, how we can uh, overcome this or how we can, these four things, improving cropland management, uh, then pasture and grazing, grazing land management. So how much, what are the type of um, crops you can prefer when you want to have a, a grazing land? Then restoration of degraded lands. So this also in a natural farming system, this uh, restoration 
of the degraded lands plays a very major role because sometime it must have been an agricultural land which has got degraded maybe due to over exploitation over exploitation or use of some other chemicals to maximum extent where so how what is the deficiency in that soil or how uh, whether there is any leaching of the water soluble minerals so how you are going to cope up with those uh, then management of the organ organic soil so these four aspects are very much important when we want to um, for all these you need the animal manure also then the alternative crops uh, like uh, we can diversify following a rotation cropping system or uh, using horticulture or horti pasture having uh, the fruit vegetables like the mango with the grazing we attempted in some farms near bangalore uh, where one uh, he was some director of agriculture i think he bought some land in north indian settled in bangalore he has uh, vast land so what we did in his farm uh, uh, mango full of mango garden uh, we partitioned the whole um, uh, mango uh, garden into uh, with fencing and uh, we cultivated uh, we, we did the practical experiment in his farm because he was so cooperative because he was already a uh, retired director of uh, uh, i think uh, icr uh, then we, uh, we partitioned the whole mango garden into small fencing inside that we grew different varieties of leguminous and uh, perennial uh, fodder grasses then uh, the uh, sheep were let in inside the mango garden to feed to graze uh, graze on that partition as a rotation grazing system and definitely it worked so earlier he used to get only revenue during the mango season uh, and now uh, he was getting more by uh, having a sheep husbandry also and it is a uh, like the sheep uh, goes with the dry uh, condition also since we enriched with uh, fodder varieties uh, they grew faster so that was one of the practical model uh, which can be propagated and uh, it uh, it was also relished by many like it was uh, it attracted many visitors also to his farm then uh, he expanded uh, some of the fringes of the mango garden uh, to uh, horticulture like the roses and uh, other plants which uh, uh, like for making bouquets and all in bangalore it's a demanding uh, thing and uh, some more like tuberose because his son was into uh, yeah, some industry who makes these perfumes so tuberose also he grew in in one portion there was a pond and a wet facility was there so there he grew to tuberose so like that where multiple cropping multiple um, uh, including the livestock system uh, he was able to get which was just a barren uh, mango tree uh, so these are uh, like the, the government agencies which is uh, promoting I will not tell different uh, uh, policy decisions like the National Mission on Sustainable Agri Agriculture, National Initiative on Climate, Food Security Mission, Mission for Integrated Development of Horticulture, Mission on Agriculture. Why I put this is you can just check these websites if there is any call for some projects because most of you are assistant professors you can try to apply uh, in under this mission to get some projects funded huh? uh, with the concept of livestock husbandry you have that component definitely you will be succeeding in getting that so now we need towards better soil health towards higher water use efficiency so this portion i'm not going to read i think you are all well versed towards better managing climate change and towards healthy livestock. Ultimately, the healthy livestock here, uh, we should concentrate on um, uh, disease control by vaccination, uh, routine vaccination, or uh, that is one of the major aspect and the preference of the particular breed. So that is what we call it as a climate smart livestock rearing, utilizing natural adaptive. This is one of the major principle. You should have native breeds in your natural farming system and native breeds which are naturally adapted to that particular uh, region. Uh, adaptive traits, which is having a trait which is adaptable. Indigenous breeds with production potential. Then breeding management where preference of the breed for that particular uh, breed in that region for the production method and disease management. So these uh, five, six principles, uh, if we adopt uh, for the native breed, uh, 
ವಿ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಡೆಫಿನೆಟ್ಲಿ ಮುಗಿಸ್ತೀನಿ ಒಂದು ಒಂದು ಐದೈದು ಸ್ಲೈಡ್ ಇದೆ ಇಲ್ಲಿ ಕ್ಲಿಯರ್ ನಿಲ್ಸಲ ಐ ವಿಲ್ ಸ್ಟಾಪ್ ವಿತ್ ದಿಸ್ ವಿಲ್ ಕಂಟಿನ್ಯೂ ವಿಲ್ ಕಂಟಿನ್ಯೂ ಆಫ್ಟರ್ ಟ ಟೀ ಬ್ರೇಕ್ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ಐ ನೀಡ್ ಟು ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪ್ಲೈನ್ ದಿಸ್
ask me to quickly finish. Uh, so one small uh, whatever uh, research uh, we have done uh, in your natural farming or zero budget farming research. No, we coordinated with uh, your scientist here. Uh, so this is um, the. Let others join. It's a small presentation. I will continue with the rest later. Uh, so this small statured breed, you know, this Malnad Gidda breed, uh, is a small statured breed native of uh, Western Ghats, and it is uh, uh, found in seven districts of Karnataka. And uh, unlike the other breeds like the Halika, Amrit Mahal, uh, which are shared uh, adjacent uh, state also, you can see the Halika in Tamil Nadu also, like that Kilar is seen in both Karnataka and the Devuni is seen in Karnataka and Maharashtra. Kilar also is seen in Karnataka, Maharashtra. But this uh, particular breed is um, uh, purely a native of um, Karnataka and it is seen in the Western Ghats, districts of Western Ghats, seven districts. And um, you can see this uh, is the star short statured breed, uh, which is concentrated only in the Western Ghat region. And, uh, it comes in uh, different colors and majority are black in color. And uh, this breed is particularly uh, breed number 37 registered and it is um, used main for its manual value and also for the milk. And uh, uh, drafting also they use uh, in the hill slopes where the, they follow some step cultivation or like that, uh, where the paddy fields are very small, no? it is of small stature, so they can go and turn for used for puddling and all those things, plowing and puddling. Uh, and um, uh, so that is how it is having all the three purpose uh, of. So these are the different color variants uh, we see in our, our college farm. And uh, this is how the breeding tract, just uh, some 50, 60 kilometers uh, you go away from this city, you can find these type of uh, dense uh, evergreen forest. Uh, earlier they used to take these animals to graze in the forest. Now uh, with the restriction in the grazing, uh, they are not allowing and it is all fenced. So they are allowed to graze only on the roadsides. And uh, the rest all they have conver converted to areca cultivation or commercial crops. So that is one of the reason where the uh, large herds which were existing in each house, they will have uncountable number of animals. Now it has reduced to 50, 20, 15 to 20 animals. Uh, that is how uh, the thing, the breeding tract. And uh, these are the, like now see, they are, they, because of that restricted grazing land, they just walk on the roadsides and they feed or whatever. And this is our college farm. Uh, where they also we have uh, where we don't tie the animal, only in the evening uh, they will be kept in the enclosures. And uh, this is one of the method which I want to explain here, uh, which is called a Sopina Kotige in uh, Kannada. Uh, so what they do is every day, uh, like this one uh, enclosure will be there, uh, they, it, their floor, flooring will be spread with the tree leaves, um, especially jackfruit leaves. Major will be at jackfruit leaves or any other leaves, it will be spread so as a bedding material for the animals. Once they come back from grazing, the animals lose inside the shed. So they come from grazing from 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock, they will remain there, all the calves and the unproductive animals, everything. One or two animals they will milk and the rest all will allow the cow to, uh, calf to suckle the cow. They won't milk. Whatever is needed for their house, that much milk they will collect. And uh, next, uh, the overnight, the whatever dung and urine voided by the animal will be uh, there in the uh, on the bedding material only. Then the next day, when the animal goes for grazing, again they put over that another layer of leaves. So like that, for almost 15 days, they will put layer after layer. Then after 15th day, they will collect the whole material and uh, put it in a pit, uh, in a pit for composting. So what happens here, because it is having uh, the more of uh, monsoonal rains, when nearly eight months it will be having rains, uh, they cannot uh, make the compost heap like thing. So they make uh, this opina kotige method. So after, uh, layer of, after 45 days or 90 days, uh, they will take the um, full composted uh, material or allow it like that only till complete composting happens and then it will be turned to the soil, especially areca, coffee or any commercial crops. Uh, then here they have uh, cardamom also, pepper also, cardamom pepper, 
uh, Arika and coffee authority of the farmer then coco coco also they have so they these uh, because all these crops require organic uh, material so that is uh, this uh, by this method this pinakoteke method they are able to increase the bulk of the manure so which um, uh, you can attempt that and i think uh, they have so this is some of the pictures of that and how they are used for uh, plowing also in the small fields uh, on the way to joga i think if they may take you to some other university campus visit uh, you can see that uh, the small fields hmm? so this is our um, whatever facility they have given we are maintaining them uh, both in the night we feed uh, dry roughage and in the day they go for grazing after grazing they come at 3 30 4 o'clock uh, then uh, after milking we put some uh, chaffed green fodder then on the night it is fed with and one uh, only milking animal we give some 250 grams of concentrate uh, that's all and the milking capacity is also less on a whole day it may give uh, two two and a half liters of milk including that is fed to the calf uh, so the manure, whatever we collected exclusively, I will not get a manure in the compost form. Uh, they have collected and they uh, we have given to Agriculture University for research. And I think Dr. Shilpa will uh, elaborate on the nutrient content and then the comparative study of Malnad Gidda, other exotic as well as the uh, whatever regular organic manure you are using. Uh, she has done a research on different crops. I think I have told because I we have not done any research on that angle. But uh, that, so Pinakotege and this I wanted to tell you how uh, it is used. And of course vermicompost also we make and directly sell it to the farmers. Because there is a demand for the vermicompost from the uh, Malnadgid animals. And uh, since this farm is separate from the other dairy farm, uh, we are able to store the native animals. Um, uh, manure. So what um, you can tell to the farmers is that the exotics uh, dung can be stored as separately and if they are having both uh, exotic and the individual uh, native animals, indigenous animals, let them uh, store these uh, as a separate uh, uh, manurial material so that uh, it will help you help the farmer for adopting the natural, um, uh, graze, the natural farming system. And, uh, and also the chaffing, the fodder is very much important uh, because it helps in conservation, feed fodder conservation. If you are giving a lengthy fodder and also uh, even overgrown napier grass also, if it is chaffed and fed, the animal prefer to eat rather than giving it as a full lengthy one where it goes as a waste. Uh, once it is trampled by the dung or soiled by the dung and urine, the animal will not eat. But still it can be turned into the manual pit. But still because we are having uh, for a shortage of fodder, we have to advise the farmer to how best they can uh, utilize the available fodder. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this is about the average milk yield is only 1.2 kgs. Uh, and then we made one more attempt. This is one of my project also, which grew into a bigger project in uh, Rashtri Krishi Vikas Yojane, where we did a small um, facility to grow fodder, organic, completely organic uh, fodder, where no chemicals were used, and um, there are different uh, fodder varieties, both leguminous and uh, perennial grasses, and then trees, uh, uh, sesbenia and, uh, and drumstick uh, trees. So in a small plot, uh, we could grow like less than uh, a quarter acre. Uh, we could grow this and it was self-sufficient for 10 Malangida animals. So now what with the same model, uh, we are uh, pro proposed for the uh, Rashtriya Krishi Vikas Yojana as a rotation grazing system where we are com creating three compartments, compartmentalized grazing. Uh, so one after another, we can uh, grow the fodder and the leguminous fodder along with the perennial uh, trees. So we can uh, use this, uh, I like a degraded land uh, can be converted into a fodder producing uh, resource. And um, since we have not used, from the beginning only, we have not used any chemical fertilizer to grow this uh, fodder. So uh, definitely that was also a waste land. So you can definitely encourage the farmers to grow such uh, fodders uh, so that organically they can have an organic milk or something testing and claim that it is an organic farm like that. So this is the, some shed and 
the fodder trees we have grown and the calves most of the calves now we have during the uh, this corona uh, we gave many of the calves and cows uh, to the farmers to whom we have trained and uh, they are all there they are all using uh, for making bejamrita jeevamrita and up to mysore uh, people have taken our animals ramnagar mysore near bangalore also uh, they have taken the animals and and now we are having uh, only 12 animals and also in that process we motivated the farmers to have uh, different um, uh, we did a practical demonstration of uh, preparation of these uh, milk products uh, from the malnad kidda alone so that uh, the taste differs and uh, pre preference so in that way we can uh, conserve the fodder the, the breed particular breed uh, because it is uh, it can be uh, sustained in this particular region with less investment and one of the malnadgeeta breeders uh, association which we created from the, uh, they grew into you know fpo farmers producers organization and they have registered and they are also going to get government support for that some uh, 300 people are members of that fpo uh, they are uh, doing bijamrita jeevamrita gana jeevamrita also from this malnadgeeta whatever they have five or six animals they you do it as a community uh, product and also uh, they they try, tried this uh, um, uh, way butter way uh, way candy so but you gram so this uh, one model uh, so that all through the year they will have three lactating cows old consumption the 4 liters can be converted in kulfi and uh, way uh, way way and paneer and uh, mutually sale uh, sale in the natural adaptation is very important like the malnad gidda of the of the skin tissues or the body surface area uh, like in the gear or uh, which is not possible to go so adaptive traits uh, so whether 